So Lassie is on her way again after being cared for by the older couple um, for, I think it said three, four weeks she lived with them. But now she's on the road again. So the chapter we are reading today, there's our picture, is called On the Road with Raleigh. Roly. Roly Palmer finished shaving and cleaned off his old-fashioned straight razor. He was a little cheery man with a red face that somehow seemed full of buttons. His eyes were like buttons, his weather-beaten lips were like buttons, there were odd bumps and warts on his forehead and chin that were like buttons. The button similarity went into actual practice in his clothes. He wore a knitted woolen overshirt, which was dotted with pearl shell buttons at every available place. Over that, he wore a curious corduroy jacket with leather sleeves, and on that were numerous brass buttons, which, if one had inspected closer, would have shown plainly as one-time fasteners of tunics in His Majesty's army. Rowley's face and form were well known throughout the north of England, for he was a traveling potter. He lived in the horse-drawn wagon caravan, which carried his goods and traveled slowly along the roads. When he came to a village or town, he would take out a stout cudgel and begin to beat one of his largest pottery bowls, an enormous thing of brown and yellow glaze. The result would be a sound like the rich-toned chiming of a great bell. And Rowley would lift up his voice and chant, Here comes Peddler Palmer, the potter. Bowls and pots, I've got lots. Bring your penny or you won't get any. Bowls and pots. He loved to make his grand entrances into the small towns of the north, banging vigorously with a great show on the pottery bowl. He always bellaboard it pr proudly for the double reason, to signal his coming and to show how stout was his ware that could not be broken by even such lusty blows. Once a year he covered his route. When his stock got low, he would circle back to his home village where his older brother, Mark, made the pottery. Mark would look up and nod from his potter's wheel in the great shed where he fashioned the old fashioned utensils. Roly would stock up again with the, wa with the wares, tiny ones enough enough for a child's bowl of porridge, up to the great ones nearly three feet across, which the northern housewives love to use for kneading their bread dough, and often for washing the baby in. He would load his van with the brown and yellow things, so shining with their crude glazes, and off he would go again. Well, I'm off, he would say. <clears throat> Mark would look up and nod and go on working. Then away, Roly would start on his route, traveling by day, at night, pulling Bess over to the side of the road by a good camping place. It was a comfortable, happy life, for in his van, Roly had a complete home. It was incredible that in such a small space, so full life could be achieved just by compactness. Often, as a great favor to a customer, Roly would let them see the living quarters. And even the best housewives looking in would exclaim over the spotlessness of the van. There was a place for everything, a place for the razor that Roly was putting away, a place for his wash bowl, a tiny rail for his towel. His cot was made, his breakfast finished, his dishes put away. Bess was harnessed, her oat bag slung beneath the cart. Roly got to the seat. Hi up, Bess, he cried. Once out on the road. Roly jumped down from the seat of his moving van and began walking alongside it. Bess had enough to pull without his extra weight, and he loved to walk, unless the weather was too bad. But the weather was good now. Roly went along with half mist of morning still hanging to the ground, singing, Oh, father, father, dig my grave and dig it with your garden spade and top of, and place on top a turtle dove to show them that I died for love. <laughs> Here's a picture of Roly walking along next to his wagon or his van. And look who can see him from the side of the road. It was a long, sad song, but Roly did not mind that. In fact, he never realized it. It was just that in his lonesome life, his own voice kept him company from town to town. He had no other company but Bess, the horse, and Toots. And Toots, she was a one, as Roly would put it. She sat on the seat now, a tiny white dog, which might have been a poodle, fox terrier, Pomeranian, or sky terrier, but was all of them. Toots was almost as well known as Roly. She could stand on her hind legs on an inverted bowl and balance and not on another Wait, and balance another smaller bowl on her nose. She could jump on a ball of wood and roll it by walking along, still balancing. 
She could pick up pennies from the ground and bring them to Roly. She could jump through hoops. Whenever Roly reached a good village, he would put on a show with Toots, not as a mountebank might to collect pence, but because he enjoyed the laughter and happiness of the children who gathered there. Between towns, Toots sat primly in the driver's seat as she sat now, regarding the road as Roly sang his doleful story of the hapless village maiden. His mind was not on the words. Instead, as always, his senses were alert to the world about him. Traveling and living in the open as he did, Roly knew a good deal about his world. He knew where magpies nested and when the swallows came and went, and no huntsman in the land had an eye any quicker than Roly's for seeing the wisp of red that was a fox. So this morning his senses were alert and his eyes flicked over the field and his song halted. He walked over beside his moving cart and stood on the step besides the shafts. Thus he rode, his body pressed against the front of his vehicle. As he went, he watched. It was a dog coming steadily across the field veering toward the road. She came without halting, as if a horse-drawn van was a thing of nature, like a tree or a deer. Roly knew that, so to keep, Roly knew that, and so kept his body out of sight. Only he muttered to himself, now what are you up to, eh? Nearer the dog came until, by a part of unfenced moorland, it slipped to the road just as the cart passed. Well, and what do you want, Roly said out loud. The dog looked up and recrossed the ditch into the moorland. Don't like my company, eh? Roly said. He got down from the step and began walking again. His eyes followed the dog, now going ahead and to his left, yet traveling almost parallel. But its passage was stopped by a stream and began moving back to the road again, where it could cross on the bridge. Roly clambered into his cart, and when he came out, he had in his hand a few small pieces of liver. Toots lifted her nose and wagged her nondescript tail. It's not for thee, my lass, Roly said. He kept his eye on the dog. It would arrive at the bridge just as his wagon did. Well, we'll pretend not to notice thee this time, he said aloud. He began singing lustily. My old father, he used to say to me, now here's a bit of good advice I'm bond to give to thee. Thou art so simple, but so very, very dense. And then, ah, gee, way there, Bess. No, not right to the ditch. Ah, gee, whoa a bit, that's it. And thy yeet is full of summit, but it isn't full of sense. The only time the art intelligent at all. So singing timing, the speed of his horse, Roly arrived at the bridge as the dog drew near. He went on singing lustily, pretending not to notice it. The dog halted as if to let him pass first. Roly did not turn his head, instead, he waved the pieces of liver in his hand so that the scent scattered in the air. Unconcernedly, he dropped one. Then he passed over the bridge. Half turning his head, he looked to see what the dog would do. Behind by the bridge, Lassie walked slower to the piece of meat. The aroma of it seemed to fill the air. Her hunger drove the saliva glands to work and her mouth filled with wetness. She walked nearer. She bent her nose to touch the meat. But training for years was there too. How carefully had Sam Caraclaw taught her not to pick up strange food. He had done that by dropping small pieces of meat at various places, and in the meat was inserted cores of burning red pepper. As a pup, Lassie had started to eat those bits and had soon discovered that they contained what seemed to be balls of living flame. Moreover, as her mouth burned, she had been scolded by the voice of her master. It's a cruel, hard thing to do, Sam Caraclaw had told his son Joe. But the only way I know that can teach him, and I'd sooner have a pup taste hot pepper than have a dog raised, a ha having raised a dog dying of poisoned meat some madman has thrown to it. And that lesson had stayed with Lassie. A dog must not eat stray bits of food. Yet the hunger in her was something that went back before training. Her nose trembled. She nuzzled the piece of liver, then suddenly she wheeled. She left the meat and crossed the bridge. Ahead of her, Roly Palmer, by his wagon, nodded his head. A good tyke and a well-brought-up one, he said. Good for thee, my tyke, but we'll see. He walked on, singing, but still wavering, waving liver in the air, so that he left what was, to a dog, a great, broad, rich swath of delectable aroma. And on that smell of desired food, Lassie now traveled. Once over the bridge, her impulse was to leave the road again and go through the fields. But she did not want to leave the trail of the sweet-smelling food. She trotted along, crossed the ditch, and began traveling slightly to the rear and parallel to the van on the road. 
Rolly Palmer sang merrily to Toots on the seat. There's a tyke that's shy and canny, but I think she's coming near. Ay, she may be fear and foo canny, but we'll overcome her fear. How's that for a rhyme, Toots? Eh, you like a companion. We'll, we'll see. So Rolly Palmer traveled along his road. Sometimes when he turned his head, he could see the collie in the fields behind him. Sometimes she was lost to view and gone for quite a length of time, but she always she would be back again, drawn to the scent of meat, following it steadily. And each time she came back, she would come a bit nearer to the wagon and to the man who seemed to pay not the slightest heed in the world to her. So it went all through the morning as they crossed flat, bleak lands. As the sun was high, Roly Palmer pulled off the road. He saw the dog halt behind him. Time for a bite, Toots, he said. Quickly, he set up a small brazier and built a fire. He boiled water and made tea. He warmed over a pot of stew and cut up liver and put it down in a bowl for Toots. He ate. All the time, he watched the collie, drawing nearer and nearer. Very ostentatiously, he fed bits of food to his little dog. He saw the collie, now sitting only 20 feet away, following with its eyes every move that his hand made. Toots barked at her shrilly once or twice, but Rolly quieted his pet properly, promptly. When at last his meal was done, he rose. Now, he said, we know a trick or two, don't we, Toots? And we'll see whether you'll eat or not. He took from his stock a flat bowl. He filled it with bits of liver. As unconcerned as if it were something he had done every day for years, he walked halfway to the collie and set the bowl down. There's your dinner, he said. Eat it up. Lassie watched him go back to the brazier. Then, as he seemed to be taking no notice of her, she rose from her sitting position. Slowly, she walked to the bowl. A dog must not eat stray bits of food. But this was different. It wasn't stray. It was set out in a bowl. That was it. It was in a bowl. And when a bowl or plate was set out by man, that meant a dog could eat without fear. There would be no living fire inside the food. Gently, Lassie dropped her head. With her front teeth, she lifted a piece of meat. She snapped it upwards, and then, in the joy of eating again, she tore into the food. She cleaned up the bowl. She licked the bowl herself, or itself, and then she sat, looking at the man as if to say, Well, for an appetizer, that was all right. Now, where's the real meal? Rolly shook his head and spoke out loud. Ah, no, you'll come along with me if you want any more. Didn't I say we knew a thing or two about tykes, toots? Put it down in the road, and it's a no-go. Somebody trained me too well, my collie friend. But put it down in a bowl? That was the secret. That made it all right. Well, up we get on, on our way. He took off Bess's nose bag and tipped his brazier and stamped out the fire carefully. Snugly, he stowed everything away. All the time from the corner of his eye, he saw the collie sitting, as if waiting to see whether a miracle of a fine dinner would happen all over again. And when at last he started and was on the road again, Lily Palmer grunted happily, for the collie was traveling with him. Not in the field now, but close behind the van. It was not too close, but Rolly didn't mind that. It would come later, he very well knew. He sang merrily. They'll hang me by the neck till I am dead. Yes, they'll hang me by the neck till I am dead. They'll take me from my bed to the gallows I'll be led, and I'll hang till I am dead. Blast your eyes. Days later, Lassie was still with Rolly Palmer. She trotted by the road, always a few feet behind the pottery van. Rolly tried to teach her to swing along under the wagon behind the rear axle as a well-trained Dalmatian carriage dog would have done in the days of traps and, and phaetons, but Lassie would have none of it. She never liked the banging and the shouting as they came into villages, but it was as if she put up with it, knowing it could not last long. She was content as long as Rolly went south. Once at a fork in the road, Rolly turned his van east. Some sense told him that part of his animal family was missing. He looked back, and Lassie was sitting at the road junction. Every time he called to her, he, she came a few steps and then circled, went back, and sat down. Finally, Rolly threw up his hands. He climbed to the seat of the van, turned Bess around, and started south on the other fork. Eh, I can just as well go around Godsey way as by Minlip, he said affably. But later he turned to Toots. You see what a poor thing a man is among women. You and Bess and Her Majesty... What chance has one lone male got against the three of ye? Bess wants to go north, because that's her home. Her Majesty wants to go south for the winter on the Riviera, no doubt. And you, eh, they content with as long as they's with me. Aye, Toots, 
There's the only one that loves me for messing alone, for messing alone. And the little dog wagged its tail that was neither curly nor straight, nor short-haired nor plumed. It was a good life traveling along the unfrequented lanes of the North Country, far from the main highways where the trucks and lorries and motor cars that Rolly hated so much went racing along. And Rolly sat, or sang, as the miles passed. Well, Your Majesty, shall us common folks do a little vulgar business? Rolly addressed the words to Lassie behind the wagon. She walked along, giving no sign of having heard. I know, Your Majesty, Rolly said humbly. It does hurt your royal ears to hear me speak of such things as money, but us humbler folk has got to live. So if you don't mind, if you don't mind, me and Toots will earn a little money. Delighted with his own make-believe, Rolly lifted his cap to Lassie and bowed low. Then he turned to his wagon and took down the largest bowl and his cudgel. He banged lustily as he approached the first house. The bell-like din echoed in the village. Rolly's voice lifted. Bowls and pots, I've got lots. Bring your penny or you won't get any. Bowls and pots. The women flocked to the doors and Rolly greeted them. He halted his wagon by the village center as the housewives fingered his wares and argued and joked about prices. They're so strong you can't break them, Rolly chanted. I broke the one I got from you last year, the woman cried. Well, I have, I have to have him break once in a while, Rolly said, his eyes gleaming. If I made him absolutely unbreakable, he'd never want any new ones and I'd do myself out of a job. He winked broadly and the women screamed with laughter and nudged each other and said, Eh, hey, he's one, that peddler Potter Palmer. <laughs> now, Rolly said when he, the buying was done, who wants to see the tyke do a few tricks? The children yelped and clapped their hands. Rolly got out the paraphernalia from the wagon and set it up. Toot scrambled nimbly from the seat. Rolly clapped his hands, but nothing happened. The dog sat waiting. Hmm. Here's a picture of them going into the new town. Rolly walking next to the van and Lassie behind. The little dog sat waiting, huh? What's the matter, Rolly said. You're waiting for someone? I see. Her Majesty hasn't arrived for the command performance. Why, here she comes now. Carefully trained by Rolly, Lassie strolled before the crowd and sat down. Rolly gave her a little bit of liver as her reward. Well, now her majesty's here at last. We can begin, can't we? Rolly pattered on. At the signal with his hand, Toots barked excitedly and began her routine. She jumped through the hoops. She told how old she was by barking. She played dead dog. She picked out the prettiest girl in the crowd, all by Rolly's hidden signals. Then she ended with her best trick, walking on a ball of wood while she carried in her mouth a tiny national flag. Doesn't the collie do out a crowd? A child cried. Why, you wouldn't expect royalty to perform, would you? Rolly answered, but it does seem like she's on a sit-down strike. Rolly advanced to Lassie, carrying Toots in his arms. Would you like to do some work, he asked. Lassie sat, unblinking. Would you like to pick up the things after the star's finished? Lassie still sat. Pick up those things, Rolly ordered in a thunderous tone. Lassie did not move, and the children screamed happily. Rolly scratched his head in mock dismay. Then his eyes brightened. He held up his finger to the children, and then he turned to Lassie. May it please your majesty, but as a favor to me, would you please pick up the things? This time he gave the signal with his hand, for the words had no bearing on the trick, and Lassie rose proudly. She pushed the wooden ball with her slim muzzle to the van. She picked up the hoops one by one and set them in a pile by the door. Rolly bowed to her. Lassie curtsied, stretching her front legs forward stiffly as a dog does after it has been sleeping. You see, Rolly said to the children, always rem remember to say please and you'll get more in this world. Well, off we go. Don't forget Peddler Palmer and the Potter. Peddler Palmer the Potter. I'll be back next year. Goodbye. The hands fluttered in the village and away went the caravan. Rolly sang happily. Toots coiled up snugly on the front seat. Bess plodded along at her steady amble. Lassie trotted unconcernedly behind. She was glad they were on the road again. She disliked the halts in the villages, and she never really liked the performances in which she played such a small part. She was unlike Toots, who delighted in the tricks and could hardly wait to go through them. Toots was a born trick dog. Lassie, she was not of that kind. Rolly Palmer knew that. He looked at Toots, who lay half asleep. Aye, she's a fine dog for somewhere, but... She'll never be as smart as thee, as thee, my sweetheart, will she? Toots gave an agitated squirm, which was meant to be a wagging of the tail. 
Roly finished the evening meal and made his caravan ready again. I, I know, you don't want to turn out again, he said to Bess, but it's a long jump this time and we'll get some of the road under our feet. It's clear enough. Roly turned his eyes upward again. There was a clear moon, but there was a Christmas in the crispness in the air too. Crispness. Really mucky weather ahead if I know it. And then winter will be down on us, and we've got to head back toward home. So we'll put on a steam a, put on steam a bit and get some done tonight. He turned the wagon out to the road, but soon there was a steady clop clop of Bess's hooves on the flinty way. Toots slept soundly on the front seat, happy to be on the way again. Lassie trotted at the near at the rear of the caravan. Roly was counting in his mind. A good four hours more, and long before ten o'clock, he should be at that snug camping place beside the Apton Woods. It would be cold by then, a nice cup of tea over the brazier to cheer him up, and then to bed, and off and up up and off with the sun tomorrow morning. Hmm. That's it for tonight. We will continue our journey tomorrow again. Have a great night.